Thanks, uh, thanks Leo, first of all, uh, for uh, accepting our invitation of this uh, seminar talk. And this is just to warn you, uh, those guys who didn't did attend uh, uh, last week Yota's uh, presentation. Hopefully you watched his uh, um, journal club, but uh, this is kind of our new attempt to engage in uh, sort of theoretical papers uh, that is interesting to us, but not that easy to understand on its own. Um, the format we kind of you know, started is uh, for one of us to do the journal club presentation on the paper that is the target, and then we clarify what is unclear or what is interesting, what is, you know, the follow-up questions are behind these, you know, papers. And uh, uh, we basically end up in doing the journal club that is quite incomplete. And then uh, invite the author, in this case, Leo, to uh, basically give the, uh, all the answers to our thorny questions. And, uh, 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 I also asked uh, Leo to give a general uh, uh, background or presentation of this paper itself. And uh, uh, um, it, in this particular case, Leo wants to also, uh, wanted to present this in some kind of bigger conference as well, right? So he wanted to uh, prepare some uh, presentation for the general audience and we will, uh, uh, after edit possibly, uh, put it onto our YouTube channel as well for their better, you know, um, broadcasting. So, all, so through the, uh, throughout this, you know, uh, today's seminar, we'll record the video, but we'll probably chop up the video into the first part of the Leo's presentation. And then the follow-up uh, uh, Q&A, probably starting from those who uh, have more general questions and then more uh, of the detailed question afterwards. And the Q&A will be there. Uh, central part of today's seminar. Okay. Is there any question about the format or intention of this seminar format? Fine. Otherwise, yeah, please go ahead, Leo. Hi, now. Um, yeah, thank you for the invitation. I hope I can <clears throat> answer all the, <laughs> all the questions. Uh, let me just also start my clock here. And I apologize in advance. It's the first time I'm presenting these. I put these slides together like this week and I didn't present yet. So there is always like some corners to, to cut. So I hope it's not going to, to be too many. Uh, yeah. Let me share my screen. I have about 10 slides um, where I'm going to be talking about our paper on the intrinsic information uh, measure or the intrinsic difference uh, measure. And this, this talk is going to have mainly three parts, a very, very brief introduction on IAT. I assume that everybody here is familiar with IAT, um, but I'm just going to do like one slide uh, recap. And I'm going to talk about information measures in general, uh, what they are trying to do and to accomplish. And then finally, about I'm going to talk about the intrinsic information measure and how it's different and very quickly talk about the results in the paper. Uh, so the integration information theory, um, I assume that, I don't know why I have this here, sorry. Can you, yes, it's better. Uh, some everybody here is familiar, but generally it starts from the essential properties of our phenomenal experience and tries to derive what are the requirements that uh, a physical substrate, right? So a physical system would have to fulfill in order to be the physical substrate of consciousness, right? So, uh, it starts with introspection and we carefully examine our experience and we try to find the properties that are present in every possible experience. And we, after they are defined, we translate them into 
um, properties that the physical system would have to obey, right? And we call these properties postulates. And then we can measure physical system systems to see if they have these properties. Sorry, to see if they are physical systems that have these properties, they are the physical substrates of consciousness by asking people when doing experiments and validating the theory or refuting the theory, right? So the properties that we have on IT are existence, intrinsicality, composition, information, integration, and exclusion, right? I'm not going in the details of what these properties they, they mean, but that's our starting point, right? IIT has identified these as essential properties of our experience, and for each one of them, devised, um, has stated what it means for a, a physical system to have these properties, right? And in particular here, I will be talking about the, the properties of mechanisms, right? So just generally, a physical system uh, that has its properties, as is stated here, it has composition, which requires that the system has parts, right? That's one of the properties. However, once this is true, we have the problem of identifying the parts, right? W what are the parts of the system? And IIT requires that these parts, they also fulfill the same properties that our, the, 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 the system itself is fulfilling, right? So it has to exist, be intrinsic, be specific or, or information uh, integrated and, and uh, obey exclusion. Um, so going back to, to the paper now, which um, I think, I don't know if you noticed, but we didn't really cite any IIT literature in, in that paper, but I will try to connect the two uh, in this talk. So. The main goal of the, the information measure that we use to measure um, the existence of mechanisms in IoT is, um, sorry, this transition is not very smooth. <laughs> so IoT relies on information measures, right? To be able to measure how much information a mechanism um, has. And the problem is that these measures, they were all designed with a perspective that's different from the perspective that IoT has to take because we are studying consciousness and consciousness has to be, is intrinsic, right? Is one of the properties. So if you look at the, the first panel here, you will see that how we try to depict this, this perspective, right? You have a little eye and hand that can see this channel, this encoder decoder between a source and a target, right? And the goal of information theory was to measure, to optimize how much information is transmitted from the source to the target, right? But taking this perspective of a designer that can make given the physical system i can make that optimal to transmit any possible information that the, the source has and that the targets will will receive and in iot the perspective is different where the encoder and the coders that you have to send and uh, receive information they are fixed they are they are the physical system itself right and that doesn't mean that we cannot have different amount of information because we can have different uh, channels, right? So you can have here in C, somebody inside an enclosure that has only one wire to receive information and one to send. But then you have another enclosure where you have eight wires to receive information and eight to send, right? And the third enclosure where you also have eight wires to receive and to send, but this one of these wires is very good like in the previous enclosures, but the other seven are very noisy, right? So the question is, what's the proper measure to tell us how much information we have in each one of these enclosures from the intrinsic perspective? That That is the goal of the, the paper. So ju just for the clarification, uh, yeah. here 
when you talk about the uh, enclosure, that's the this black thick lines, right? From B yes, to E. The the enclosure is the very thick square, right? Yeah. Okay. Where you have uh, inside an eye and a hand. The eye is the cause side in IoT, so it's receiving things, right? Mm -hmm. And the hand would be the effect side where you're causing something. In the okay. World. And then that corresponds to the mechanism in the statement above. The perspective of the mechanism means that the perspective from inside of this enclosure. Exactly. Okay. I have another slide that was connecting the two, but that's exactly true, yes. The mechanism in this case is represented by an enclosure, right? Is an attempt to give an intuitive understanding of what is the intrinsic perspective. Because if you say, take the perspective of a mechanism, that's very um, ethereal, right? It's very hard. But here we try to say, look, you're inside this enclosure and you have this input channel that is fixed. It, it's an encoder you can't change. You don't have access to it, right? Yeah. And you have that's fine. To send. Right. Yeah. And then probably the central part of the discussion, the clarification that we want is that how much you would allow this, you know, enclosure or the mechanism to have in terms of the capacity or property or assumption or knowledge or, you know, uh, capability of the kind. I imagine that, you know, you wanted to get, make this enclosure thing as thin as possible without assume, assuming much, right? Most likely. But uh, how much you are assuming for this enclosure to have is the probably unclear part of the paper. But, right. you know, I, I just wanted to, you know, warn That's, you the core of our question. That's good to know. Yeah, we, we can definitely discuss that. Okay. Uh, as a general answer, I can say now that we can like go into details later that the, the idea is that the system itself has the properties, right? It's not like there is someone in there that mm. is deciding anything, right? Mm. It's just mm. to be able to see what the system can do, you have to put yourself inside the system and take its perspective in a sense that if you get something wrong in your input and you send something wrong, this is going to be what the person receives, right? So imagine that you have like, in this case, a mechanism would be just a copy gate, right? So the mechanism in the enclosure E is receiving a letter S and sending a letter E, but it's receiving a letter S, right? So independent of how much you, you want to, to define that the, the enclosure knows, that's what happens, right? So it, it's based on what is the physical system instead of having a physical system where the meaning is um, a kind of software, right? Is a logical part. Here, the physical and the logical parts, they are the same. So that's, that's what the system knows. It's what the, phys the system is. But we can clarify that uh, in, in the discussion. Okay. Um, yeah, and I, you probably noticed that in the paper, we are mostly talking about the, the cause side, right? But everything applies for the effect side. And you can see that in the traditional information measures, you have only one encoder decoder that's being used to send and then to receive. And here we separate them because they're not necessarily the same, right? What causes you, it's not the same that you cause. So they, they are two channels, if you will. But we we can we have to analyze one of them at a time, and everything that's true for one of them is true for the other. So now I will talk about information measures in general, and in the end go back to this problem that I just presented. Right? How can we measure information from the intrinsic perspective, and decide between enclosure C, D, and E which one has most intrinsic information, or information from the intrinsic perspective? Uh, I, I really like this paragraph from, from Shannon's original paper where he says literally that the, the fundamental problem of communication is to reproduce at one point the message selected another, right? And that, of course, these messages, they have meaning and they will correlate or refer to some physical, right, entities. 
but the semantic aspects aspects of communication are irrelevant to the engineering problem. So this is this says everything that is relevant uh, for this introduction in information measures and how it connects to IoT. Right? IoT has the opposite view. It says that the meaning is the physical system. There is no such a thing as mapping something into the physical system. You are the physical system and you have to identify the properties of this physical system, right? So the meaning is there. And same thing in, in 75, Alexander Oxidad wrote one of the most classical books in information theory. They say that you can axiomatically characterize, right? The, the channel entropy in terms of natural properties, right? Which are essential from the point of view of information theory. And the problem is to determine which properties are natural or essential. And Shannon, he required the three properties from his measure. He required that the measure is continuous, that it monotonically increase with the size of the channel if the channel is completely noisy, right? So if there is, he wanted a measure of uncertainty. So it makes sense that the bigger the channel, if you have zero certainty of the what's transmitted, the more uncertainty you have, right? And it should increase monotonically. And the third property requires that if you break that probability down into subi events, right? The original amount of uncertainty you have has to be a weighted sum the new, sorry, the new amount of uncertainty you have it has to be a, a weighted sum of the original um, values of H. I think it is inverted. <laughs> so if you, I, I'm going to give an example because this is a tricky one. If you have an event, right, that has probability half one third and one sixth of happening. If now you break these two events that have one third and one sixth probability of happening into uh, another sub event, right? So first you get event one or symbol one in the case of our enclosure. And then you get now instead of symbol three and four, you, uh, two and three, you get symbol one B for instance, half of the time. And after you get symbol one B, then you can get symbol two and three with probably two thirds and one third, right? In a way that if you ignore the intermediate part, you end up with the same three symbols with the same probability. And when what he required that the information you have here in the first trans channel is the information that you have in this channel with half and half probability plus half because the second event only happens half of the time, the information that you have in this smaller branch here, right? With two thirds and one third. So that's what channel required. And he proved that there is only one function that obeys these three properties, and it's the famous channel entropy, right? But these properties, as I was saying, they are important from the perspective of a channel designer. If you want to make sure that you get every available information in the channel, that you can build the optimal channel encoder uh, the optimal encoder and decoder to reach channel capacity by implementing a her correction code, that's the correct measure. But in the case of the enclosure that I just presented, you don't have this capability. You can't go here and say, oh, I'm going to change my inputs. No, you are your inputs, right? So this, you cannot have this additivity that's the modern name for this branching property or the, the more, um, the name that it has for independent probability, you cannot have that from the intrinsic perspective for every probability. Uh, and just one other information measure that I like with Hemi uh, entropy. He questioned, for instance, why this weight here is half, right? Why am I weighting this by half? Wait, there is uh, no. Leo. Yeah. If it's complicated, uh, answer, then you can leave it later. But I don't get why this particular thing that branching is not possible from the intrinsic point of view. Uh, 
it's complicated. I think we, we should also discuss this in Okay, in the later. It, That's it's fine. the implications of the additivity, right? It means that you have access to everything that it's being sent and received, right? And from the intrinsic perspective, you only have access to what's happening at that time that you get a symbol. And it's either wrong, right or wrong. Okay, if that's the case, then there, you, what, what you're saying sounds like there is no probability. There is a probability that you get one symbol, right? Suppose that there is one symbol, that's the message. The message is one symbol. That symbol will have some information. If it happens all the time, it has, let's say, maximum amount of information. Because if the guy sends you up, you go up. If he sends you down, you go down. But, but if when, when you start to talk about all the time, it implies that there is some kind of memory, and the memory exactly, is uh, exactly okay, and that, that you Which allow that to the, hmm. no, you can coarse grain in time and have different mechanisms, right? But then it's a different mechanism. That's that's the whole point. If you coarse grain in time or space, or if you if you merge the, the symbol, if you have a different alphabet, you are a different mechanism. So maybe maybe more... we, we can leave it uh, as I expect. It's a bit probably complicated. Yeah, this, this is very, it's very crucial though. But the idea is that you are a particular mechanism that has a certain amount of information and you cannot average, average over all possible transmissions. You cannot change your alphabet. If you cause something to be on, it's on and that's it. But we can go back to it later. Okay. Uh, please remind me if I forget. Yeah. Uh, and so just an example of how we can change these properties, right? Hany, he was curious why this weight half here. For instance, you can have other weights. There is no reason to wait by the probability of happening. And again, he showed that there is only one function that uh, can have arbitrary weights defined by this parameter alpha, which is also a sum over all, all possible events. And when alpha goes to one, if I'm not mistaken, this converts back to Shannon entropy, right? But it's a different information measure that was shown to be unique given certain requirements. And that's the main, it's the key thing here. We want to know which properties should IIT require from an information measure if, as we're going to discuss afterwards, um, additivity doesn't make sense from the intrinsic perspective, which properties they, they make sense. So we propose three properties. The first of one, uh, the first one is called causality, which is the existence property in IoT, and it requires that the information it should be zero if and only if the probability when the mechanism is there is the same as when the mechanism is not there or chance. So the only time that you have zero information is when it doesn't matter if there is anyone in the enclosure. It doesn't matter if the mechanism is there. You always have the same probability of observing all the symbols. So this is causality. The other property that we require that's related to the additivity property is specificity, meaning that the measure should reflect how much information is transmitted by one individual symbol. You are there in the enclosure and you're gonna get a symbol. How much information is there in that symbol that you got? That's that's the question, right? It's not how much information on average you're gonna get over all possible transmissions. And finally, the last property is intrinsicality, which, which is based on the, the same name, the property with the same name on IoT, which says that the measure should increase, the amount of information should increase if the number of symbols increase in a repertoire without noise, and that's critical, 
So without noise, it should be additive. But when you have noise, it should dilute. And the only case we can uh, know reason from first principles, how much it should dilute, is the case where you have uh, part of the channel that is what we call fully unconstrained, meaning that the probability of observing the symbols is equiprobable when the mechanism is there and when it's not there. So the one, one common question that we get here is why one over M, right? Why, why do you dilute by the number of states in the unconstrained probability? And the, the most straightforward reason is it's very intuitive. Imagine that you have a channel that's formed by P, Q, right? P, N, and Q, N here. It's the probability when the mechanism is there and the probability when it's not. So, Imagine that P is fully constrained because it's easier intuitively. This means that every time, if you have like four possible symbols, right? Every time you send a symbol, you get that specific symbol, not any one of the other three, every time. So you have kind of perfect, perfect information with size four symbols, right? Which is two bits. But now you mix these with another channel that has zero, it's fully undetermined. This means that every time you send that symbol that you received correctly, sorry, when you send that symbol that you received it correctly every time, now you're gonna receive it correctly one over M times, because sometimes that symbol is going to be mixed with the noise and you cannot separate. That's what I was talking about the alphabet. The alphabet now is bigger. And from the intrinsic perspective, you cannot say I'm only using these parts of my input. If you do that, you are a different mechanism, right? Um, and that's, that's, the, that's the reason that additivity cannot work for all probability distributions from the intrinsic perspective, because you don't have access to separate the signal from the noise by changing the alphabet and building an optimal um, encoded decoder. We, in the paper, we demonstrate that there is only one function, one information measure that obey all these three properties simultaneously. And it's this, um, it has this form and we call it the intrinsic information measure. Alpha here is each one of the possible symbols that you can receive or send. So if now we apply this measure to our example, imagine that you have the enclosure, it, we call the ABC problem, right? You have an enclosure A where you have one perfect wire, every bit that the the source sends to you, you receive perfectly here in your screen. Now you can add to this perfect wire seven other perfect wires. And you have the same, uh, you have a screen which will show you the correct symbol every time, the same way that you did before. The difference being that now this alphabet is much bigger because you have two to the eight possible symbols, while here you have only two, right? A dot and a dash. Now you have all the, the ASCII characters in, in your screen and they're always correct. And that's the key point. And in the third enclosure, you have the same perfect wire that you have in enclosure A, but you have seven wires that they are fully noisy, basically fully noisy, right? They are they will transmit the right information half the time and the other half the wrong one. Now your screen is going to show you the correct symbol very rarely. One over uh, every 127 times, right? Basically on average. And intuitively for us, this is 
way worse than in closure A, because even though you only has one bit of information here, you see it correctly every time. So for instance, if we do, for the example, the sender, the, 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 the effect side, right? If we put a decoder that's perfect, and if it only receives one bit of information, it's going to accumulate, right? Just for the examples. From an intrinsic perspective, there is no accumulation, but it's just to show why we think, to get, get, get intuition why it's so much worse. Here, after eight transmissions, you always get one correct character, right? The character I, for instance. While you're in the second, every transmission you get a correct character. So it's, for us, it seems much better than the first one. Now, the third one, on average, after eight transmissions, you, were, you didn't get any character that's correct. You only get like wrong characters. And this is going to repeat again and again and again for like, 127 times. And then in the 128th, you get a correct one on average, right? So it's uh, way more. Yeah. OK, so sorry to interrupt. But uh, this part is going to be you know, really the central of our discussion. You know. Yeah, yeah. Here uh, it's basically it's... The, the, the last slide. So okay. we, we can go in. We can, we can start the, the questions. Yeah, uh, I have I have an intuitive, <laughs> a more intuitive example of why why this is true. But you can you can ask your question. Yeah, but uh, this time it's just a, 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 at the least you know for the first uh, clarification first. Okay, uh, yeah. so when you are starting to talk about you know, for us, this is worse, or for this system, this is worse, and things like that. It starts to become very very unclear or blurry whether you are talking about the extrinsic perspective or intrinsic perspective already. And that's very confusing for us. For example, let's say when you say, you know, the, the left side A is more reliable for us, you know, it seems to sound to us that, you know, you already know from an extrinsic point of view that these are the correct things. And then whatever this, you know, enclosure system is producing is correct so you are it seems like you know you are already introducing this extrinsic perspective yeah. from the intrinsic perspective it shouldn't know whether it is doing well or not right I same mean, for this should, one it should it should i but agree then you are assuming something is about you know this enclosure which has a uh, capability or knowledge about the extrinsic world or belief yeah, 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 definitely. about that. Okay. Definitely, yeah. Okay. Because the properties, they come from your experience, right? So it's really hard to pretend that a mechanism has the same experience that we do. I agree with you. The problem is that for consistency, we have to, because if we don't mm -hmm. do that, what are the properties that a mechanism has to, Okay. right? Okay, so you are assuming some kind of knowledge or expectation or prediction about the world for each of the this enclosure yeah not 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 about not about the world but about what it itself uh, input it's and the output yeah okay yeah yeah so let, this let me part, show you yeah okay go ahead. this part is going to be probably very interesting to also Jakob as well because this may be a sort of a potential you know contact between you know predictive coding and IIT but anyway, please go ahead. Yeah. So imagine that you have a hoverboard, right? I used this last time I went there in Munich and uh, yeah. I'm going to repeat the, the slide. So the first enclosure, at least in the cause side here, would be equivalent to having a hoverboard with only one jet. You can go at a certain speed and you go with perfect control. If you turn right, you turn right, if you turn left, you turn left never fails. Now imagine that you have another hoverboard that has two perfect jets, you know, attached to each. Uh, in the case of the enclosure, it's eight, but doesn't matter, right? Let's pretend it's only two now. They are perfect. From, from the intrinsic perspective, one would expect that the guy in the second hoverboard 
has more whatever you want to call information or causal power or let's call it causal power now than the first one. It has more, it goes faster, you can call it whatever you want, but it has more of what the first guy had because they are both perfect and that's the key part. Now, if you get a third hoverboard that has a broken propulsion system, that it's random, randomly goes on and off. Traditional information measures that you would attribute as much causal power to these hoverboards as the first one. Mainly because they assume that you can rewrite this hoverboard and just turn off the bad one, right? And now you only use the, the good one, which is essentially what it does. Error correction codes, they're doing that. You just, if you have a fully noise wire, just ignore, and now you make, you only use the good one and you can accumulate and make the same alphabet that you're making for, you know, the one with two jets, it just takes twice as long. The problem is that here you cannot because you are the, the jet, you are, you get the signal with the noise, right? So your causal power in, in, in a sense is contaminated by whatever bad is happening. So in this sense, when I say for us, it seems like the first is better than the last one. I mean, in this sense of being the guy inside the enclosure, if I'm the guy inside the enclosure and I have, if I have the three enclosures and I have to choose one to receive information, I will choose the first one and not the last one. And I of see. course, of course okay. there is a trade-off and you now can change the noise here in the noise wires from full to fully constrained. And because the, 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 the function is smooth, you expect at some point to break even. And the, one of the key developments for us was to not impose anything in this break even. We don't want this to be by design because we don't know when does it break even. We know that it should break even at some point. I see. I, I think I, yeah, I totally understand this now for, for the first time. <laughs> So what you, uh, I, I also didn't understand that how important that the effect of size was up until now, but uh, what you are saying in my, you know, uh, rephrase is that it tries to measure how much this enclosure can do, right? Exactly. I yeah. see. Now I- Action, action is okay. key. So I see the connection I see. to okay. predictive coding. It's all I, about- I think, yeah. All but also how it's... much you're acted upon. Right, right, right. So right. If, if now instead of the jet, right. you have uh, someone telling you the, the, the path to leave a burning house. I see. If you get 107 messages, they are wrong, that you, you die, right? So I see. it doesn't matter that you do things perfectly. If your right. input is super noisy, right. you die. Right. So it's better to have instead of getting something like enclosure B that gives you the, you know, the GPS location of the exit, right. you right. have something that's telling you up, down, left, right, but perfectly, then have something that gives you 107 wrong GPS locations and right. you go to the right. wrong place and then you, you burn, you know? I see. Because, you know, we completely neglected this side of the action part in our general club discussion. And that's probably the one of the reasons why we didn't figure out what you are trying to do. And now I can also understand why you have these eight wires in the bottom of this each of the figure, which probably we didn't also even discuss last time. So what you meant here is that the, this enclosure has a capability to given a eight perfect out wires, but if the input is only one, then it can do only one. And if it can have an eight perfect wire, it can do eight. And if it has a seven noisy wires, then it can do less than what we can do compared to this one. Exactly. Okay, now I, I get everything. I exactly. Think. If you fix that, because it's hard to show what does it mean from the intrinsic perspective without having both the, the what we call the source and the target. So I to see. make the, the, the thing, the example more explicit, we just fix the target as being equal for all of them. So that the only difference is the source, but you could flip this around. I see. Suppose that the source, they are always perfect and now the output 
of the last one is noisy. That's the, the jet example. I that see. I showed. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. And one of the key results is that there is a break even point here in, in the E. If you change the noise so that it becomes small enough, at some point, we say that you're going to have as much intrinsic information in the good one wire, in the perfect one wire, and in the noisy eight wires, mm. right? And that there are some nice uh, analytical results for that. For instance, if all the wires, they are noisy, and you go from fully noisy to fully constrained, the break even to one wire is one over E to the N. So in this case, it's going to be 0 0.78, I think, the probability of these wires transmitting the correct information, right? So in the jet case, it would be a jet that it's not so bad. You just like shake a little bit, but you still move way fast. You move faster than the first one. So there is a trade-off between um, sensitivity and uh, um, causal and, and power. And this is not new. People know that in the information theory literature, it's just they always require an extrinsic, uh, and, and not extrinsic, but an extra parameter to decide what's the break even. Usually, it's the accepted amount of noise. So there is even an example in the appendix of the paper where we show what's the amount of noise right, for the break even that you could use the K out to select. But again, from the intrinsic perspective, there is no such a thing. You, you are that mechanism, right? So I have a, a slide here that tries to make the IIT version of the ABC example. If you are a mechanism that has an activation function like this, a sigmoidal activation function, you are a noisy majority gate, right? A little system like this, ABCD. Uh, if you look at the mechanism A over B, you have a certain, uh, the bar, the, 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 the black bar is the, the unpartitioned probability and the white bar is the partition probability. If A to B is perfect, that's what you have when you partition like this, the fully full partition, right? You have a state up, all the time. And when you partition, you have up and down randomly and you'll get some amount of information. But when you have A over BC, because now in IIT 4.2, the, the for first order mechanism, you are only allowed to have the full partition, the complete partition where you complete sever the, the mechanism from the purview is the only way to destroy the mechanism. You get, um, if C now, it's not perfect, right? It is, it has some amount of noise. So sorry, I, I said that they all have the sigmoidal function. It's not true. A over B is the square function, meaning it's a deterministic majority gate. C is the sigmoidal function where you have some amount of noise. And D is this almost flat line, right? D is almost random. So if you have A over B, that's this perfect majority gate, you have this distribution and you have a certain amount of causal power. But now A over BC, you're going to have a different amount of causal power that, according to the intrinsic difference, is higher than A over B. But if you go to A over BD, D is basically completely noise, right? So imagine that you're a mechanism A and you're causing BD, sorry, to be up, down instead of up, up. This is going to happen half the time. It's much worse than before where you said up, it's up. So you have way less causal power than just A over B. And that's what the intrinsic difference trying to capture this. Because if I could now, like <laughs> what a, a traditional information measure does is to come here and say, well, let's make an error correction code over BD and only get you know, the up state of the first guy. Of course you can do that. Then it's equivalent to A over B, but literally in IIT, this is going to be A over B because you macro B and D together. 
Does it make sense? It's going to be another unit. So you cannot change the alphabet without changing what is the physical system that you are considering. That for me would be uh, the main message and kind of answer your question about additivity, right? Why additivity is not possible from the intrinsic perspective? Because you don't have the power to change your physical connections as a physical system. I mean, you could, but then you become a new physical system. So that's basically what we do when we learn and we, we evolve. But at a certain moment, you are that physical system that has a certain encoder decoder that was not designed by any channel designer. But at the same time, it has a certain amount of information that it transmits. And the question is how much? Okay. Yeah, maybe you can probably go to the conclusion slide and then uh, wrap up the first uh, session. I interrupted a lot, but uh, no, it's I think great. That, uh, uh, probably I'm, clarified at least from yeah, my understanding. It's, yeah, yeah, it's it's a question that comes uh, the the reviewers they were always asking that right. How do you decide that you have access to the partition probability, for instance? It's not that we decide this is just the definition of what the system is. And if you get something different, you get literally a different system that's doing something different. And the idea is to measure how much information you have in each one of these systems. Right? So, yeah, information measures, they can be used to assess the causal power of a system or the mechanisms or the mechanisms in the system by comparing the probability distribution of observed states before and after severing the connections between the elements, right? And in IIT, these measures, they should reflect how much causal power a system has over itself from the perspective of the system. And as a consequence, as I mentioned in the beginning, from the perspective of the mechanism, because to be consistent, that's what we have to do. And not from the perspective of an external designer. And the existing information measures, they are axiomatically defined from the extrinsic perspective of a designer. Of course, that's what they were doing. They were trying to make a measure that helps them to build the optimal channel or the optimal system. But here we are just asking if I am the system, how much information I have. And that's what the intrinsic information measure is axiomatically defined to do. And we show that if we fix the three properties, existence, intrinsicality, and information to behave the way they do mathematically, as we think is reasonable. There is only one information measure that can obey those properties simultaneously. Yeah. And future work includes developing a unique measure to measure the integrated information of the system as a whole. And this is something that we are currently working and that will be part of the IoT 4.0 um, paper. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. I think, uh, yeah. Now it's it's becoming clear how um, about this. So before opening to the more detailed questions, um, if anybody wants to have a uh, General question or comments? Uh, I don't know if Jacob, do 